All right, here I am outside of the home of Megger Ever, Megger Evers, who was a NAACP um, leader and civil rights leader. And he pulled up here in his driveway one, one night. And the moment he got out of the car, he was shot in the back by where our bus is. Where our bus is right now, that uh, behind there were, were, there were not houses. And Negra Evers arrived home, pulled up in his driveway, and the moment he stepped out of his car, he was shot in the back by a high-powered rifle. And his wife and kids waited inside the home. Negra Evers um, bled to, uh, he died right here. In this, in this driveway, um, the, the uh, murderer finally finally was convicted in 1994. So, y'all waiting on me? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, we didn't know you acting. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. So you Sorry, heard guys. it at the time. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this is where Meg Evers brought his family after he became the first field secretary for the NAACP. His responsibilities were great. Uh, but he came into this area, onto this street, because this is your first, uh, if you want to call it a subdivision, that's what they called it then. This is your, these are your homes, the first homes, uh, as they call houses for middle class professional blacks that were uh, allowed to happen during that time. But Mega came in here, not he said, not that I considered myself middle class. He said, but I had a connection with the two young men who were building houses on this street. There were two young black World War II veterans who had owned this little strip of land for a long time. They had been trying to build houses for what they call middle class professional blacks, but were not allowed to do so because this little street here was sandwiched between two white streets and that just yeah. wasn't gonna happen. Uh, whites lived on the street that you were coming in on. When Mega was here, the first four houses on the end were not there yet, and whites were moving in back here. But Mega came in here, as I said, he said, I had a connection with those two guys. They're veterans and so am I. That's why I'm coming in here. But we talk about how Mega grew up and how he got, uh, was able to come into it and when he came into this neighborhood. He grew up in a little old town up near where Elvis Presley grew up, but under total different circumstances. Mm -hmm. But Mega also grew up with whites, around whites. Naturally, if you did, you associated with them, especially uh, the young kids. Uh, even the old, the adults associated to a certain extent. And that's what uh, kind of set Mega off on his trek, if you will, or the path that he took. He said, I lived up around these white kids. We associated together. We hunted and fished. He said, they were my buddies. He said, but when I got to be a certain age, I had to leave those guys. And I had to begin calling kids my age and even younger white kids, Mr. Mrs. Mm -hmm. Saying yes, sir, and no, sir. Didn't understand that. Didn't know why it had to be that way because these were my buddies that I had played with. He said, and I talked to my daddy about it. My dad would tell me, well, Mega, that's how things are does not make you less of a person because of how people treat you, not if you know who you are. But there are some things you're going to have to do to survive in this kind of environment. But Mega said, he said, before I was 12 years old, he said, I had witnessed two lynchings. He said, one was a friend of my dad's. He said, my dad and I were in the woods one morning. We came up on these men lynching one of my father's friends. He said, I thought it was so cruel. I asked my dad, why would they do that to him? He said, Mega, that's what they do but what you must do to survive in this kind of environment. And then he talked about, he said, after they lynched him, they drug him downtown to show him off. And this is working with Mega's mind. And then he said, there was a 10 year old kid who goes to the Mississippi White Fair, the state fair. He said, uh, the fair would come in and, and when I was growing up and do the same thing, but it would, it would come into your area at different times. It would operate two weeks, a week or better, that kind of thing, and then it would be whites only. Then they'd close it down, take away some of the wonderful rides and activities, and they'd open it back up and it would become the colored fair. 
Megan said, this kid doesn't tell anyone. He goes to the white fair. He said, they lynched that kid and they put him on a fence. He said, they leave him there until his body began to deteriorate, take him down and bury him. He said, but they leave his clothes right there because that was a warning to both races. He said, because both races passed that kid, nobody talked about it. Mega, it is messed with his mind, so he wants to get away. So he, at the age, as I said, the age of 16, he quits high school, goes into World War II. And he talked about traveling, defending America. He said, the things I saw, he participated in uh, the Normandy invasion. And he just talked about a lot of other stuff. He said, while I was over there, it didn't seem to matter too much about the color of my skin. He said, sure, we were segregated. He said, but nothing seemed to happen as it was happening at home. He said, okay, I do my time and I get out of service and I come home. He said, and that stuff starts all over again. He talked about trying to register to vote on his 21st birthday because back then you had to be 21. He said, my, my brother, who was also a veteran, and some free other veterans and I, he said, we go downtown to register to vote. He said, these white men run us off with shotguns. He said, we go home and get ours. And when we come back, he said, the number had tripled. He said, and an old white lady was sitting in a truck and she stepped out and walked over and said, son, it ain't worth you losing your life over this. One day, you'll be able to vote. Mega said, it made me get serious though. And I began to think and I said, let me do something. So he gets into Alcorn College. Uh, high, uh, now University. At that time, Alcorn had the high school and then the college. So he gets in and he majors in business administration. He plays football. He runs track. He starts some business venture. He does a lot of stuff while he's there. He's a little bit older than the average college student. But one of the most important things we think he did, he organized the first debate team. And he was the first black. <laughs> and he was the first black to debate at Millsaps College, then an all-white college here in, in Jackson. And when you read about Millsaps, even though it was all white, Millsaps students got involved in the movement as well. But anyway, so at, well, he met his wife, he met Merle when he she was a freshman. And uh, so when he finished, they got married and they moved to an all-black town up in the Mississippi Delta called Mount Bayou, Mississippi. Uh, Mount Bayou, as I said, no one lived there, as they said, but colored folks. And Mount Bayou had this nice hospital in it that served the surrounding areas. And there was a young black man up there running that hospital. But also, his name was T.R.M. Howard, but also T.R. was rich to be a, a black man at that time. Uh, this, this guy, I can't think of his name right now, did a book on T.R. a couple of years ago, and he titled his book T.R.M., the, the cocky S.O.B. Because <laughs> T.R. was, as they said, to be a black man, he was filled to rich. Didn't take no stuff off of anybody. But he had some self-help programs going up there, and he was helping... Poor, he was helping the whites as well as the colors. But Mega went up there to sell insurance. He said, T.I. invited me. Mega, why don't you come up here and sell insurance for me? Mega said, that's what I went up there to do. He said, but T.I. pulled me in, if you will, and began teaching me how to organize. He said, I started selling insurance in a little old town called Clarksdale, and I saw how people were living. He said, while I was selling my insurance, he said, I was talking to them about voting and education because I knew those were two things that would bring them out of their conditions. He said and right away they told me, well, Mr. Evans, they don't let us vote. And then he said that in a little town there was school, a school, a couple of schools, he said, so I just continued to talk. He said, then I left the town and went out onto the big farms, those things they call plantations. He said, and what did I see out there? He said, the conditions under which people were living, he said, I'm talking about whites as well as blacks, and then the term was coloreds. He said, was so terrible. He said, some of those people didn't even have wooden floors and our windows in their homes, and here I am pushing insurance. I felt bad. I began talking to them about two things that I knew would bring them out of that condition. Voting, education. Mr. Evers, they don't let us vote. Mr. Evers, this person, a, a mind this, a mind that, tried to register to vote. They disappeared, we've never seen them since, or they were beaten or murder, or that kind of thing. He said, I just continued talking to them. Then they told me, ain't no schools out here. If so, we go to school so many weeks and we write back out on these farms. He said, I just continued talking to them. 
until I made a huge mistake. I gave a young black man, excuse me, I gave a young black man a voter registration application. He couldn't read not right, he thought it was for insurance. So he takes it to his boss to help him complete the app because he wants insurance. And when the man sees what it is, he gets together with the rest of the plantation owners and they won't let Mega come back. Mega said, I told him, that's okay. We can still change some minds up here. Let's do some boycotts. He said, they asked me, what's that? And I told him, well, you know, they let us buy the gas and won't let us use their bath bathrooms. We go into their stores, they shoot the prices up when we walk in, and sometimes they make us stand in line till all the white folks are served. So we're going to get people who got cars to come in here and take you outside the area. This is called a boycott. Mega said, they said, where are we going to shop? He said, we're going to get these people to come in here, and they're going to take you someplace to shop. He said, we began to do that, and those people began to act a little bit better about, toward us. Then he talked about when the first educational act came about. He said, I always wanted to be a lawyer. The only school in the state of Mississippi that offered a law degree was the University of Mississippi, now Ole Miss, of course, and they wouldn't let him in. And this is when the national NAACP had been watching him, so they, they didn't have a field secretary. So they said, Mr. Evers, how about becoming field secretary for the Mississippi NAACP? He agreed to take the job because he needed the money. He has a family. He needed the money, and he was already into organizing and stuff. But to do that, he got to come into Jackson. And he comes in here, as I said, on this street, and he select this lot. He said, because I came in here, there were two veterans who were trying to build houses on this little street. But they wouldn't let them do it because this one street, as I said, was sandwiched between two white streets. But they finally got approval, and Mega came in here and selected this lot. He said, I did that because there was a house already standing on the left and one was on the right. He said, and for safety purposes, I nestled mine between the two. And he came in here with a wife and two kids. Third one was born here. He said, do this to me. Make these changes to my house. He said, all bedrooms on the east wall at this time, raise those windows a little higher than the other house like this. Because... I'm bringing a wife and my two kids in here, and those, that's where the bedrooms are. And then he asked them, don't give me a front door. So you drive around, own a house in the area without a front door. He said, because I'm going to teach my kids, I don't care who they're riding with, they got to come under the carport and let them out. And I want them to get out of the car on the passenger side, using the wall and the car as a means of protection. Mm -hmm. Come down that wall and right into the house. Well, the first year they were here, someone shot through this window. So after that, they'd come down the, the wall into the house, eat, and retreat to the back. When someone shot through the window, Mrs. Elva said, Mega said to her, we know furniture is not going to block bullets, but put your piano on one corner, and on, your, on the other corner, stand a couch on end. That's just so people can't look right into the house. And then take the kids' beds down and put the mattresses on the floor. She said, that's what we did. Second and third time it was shot into was through their bedroom window. She said, we all got on the floor then. But when you go back there, there's a bed up. That's because Castle Rock Entertainment, Rob Reiner, executive producer, director, used this house for some of the scenes, the movie The Ghost of Mississippi. And they put a bed up back there in her room. She didn't quite like that when she came. Then she talked about Mega traveling so much and there being alone a lot. She said, somebody tried to come in on us, on us through the back door one night. We simply pushed the refrigerator across the back door and left it that way. Then one night, someone threw a, a couple of weeks, uh, days rather, before Mega was assassinated, someone threw a Molotov cocktail uh, under her car and set the car ablaze. Other things happened, but she said, those were like the major, major. Then she and the neighbors, cause quite a few of them are still here, began to talk about the night of the assassination. You know, it was June 12th, 1963. Coming up to what we call Freedom Summer. Freedom Summer is when all of these young people came in here with some older ones too came in here and went up in that Mississippi Delta trying to set up, um, get people registered to vote. They became investigators, getting people to donate books and clothing for the people up there. This is uh, the next year, as it says, 64, this is when your three civil rights boys were murdered up in Philadelphia, Mississippi. The two white boys from New York and the black boy from up there in that area. So that's what they were preparing for. But John Kennedy was our president at that time. 
And Kennedy went on television that night and delivered what a lot of people, especially the whites, called his first civil rights speech. What Kennedy said angered a lot of people. He was talking about the rights of all people and how things had to change and that kind of thing. And it made a lot of people angry, but as they would say in the movement, things were happening anyway, hot and heavy and breaking out. So Megan watched Kennedy's speech in his office. He left there and went downtown to a church for a mass meeting. And a lot of people said the assassin, Byron D. LeBeck, within two of his friends were sitting on a back pew. And nobody paid them any attention, which you would not necessarily have done so because you had a lot of whites involved and naturally they would be at the meetings. Maga left there, went and picked up these t-shirts that the, the marchers were going to wear the next day. On the front of the t-shirt said, Jim Crow must go. Mm -hmm. And he picked the shirts up and came home and pulled into his driveway. Mrs. Evers already under the carport. He's way behind her. He gets out of his car and goes to his trunk and get these t-shirts. And when he turns to come under the carport, Byron D. Lebeck, the, the assassin, is waiting for him all the way across Missouri. When you go out, there's a beige house over there with blue shutters. It was not there then. In fact, they're doing some work, so we're taking stuff down. But in fact, this is what it looked like across the street over there that night where Beckwith was. Uh, you can see it a little bit later. But when Mega turned to come under the carport, Beckwith stood and fired with a 30 yard 6 infield rifle and the bullet catches Mega in his back under his right shoulder going through him through the last pane of the window. Mrs. Ever said, the kids and I are sitting on the floor. Well, the kids are sitting on the floor. They always did so they'd be lower than the window. She said, we're watching a rerun of John Kennedy's civil rights speech. She said, we hear Mega when he drive up. He doesn't come right in, so we just continue to watch television. She said, then we hear this loud bang. She said, we hit the floor, begin crawling to the bathroom because the kids had told Mega, should something happen, the safest place in the house is the bathtub. She said, that's where they were headed and I was crawling right behind them until I hear a loud thump. I don't know what it is, she said, but it made me jump and run for the door and I knew better than that. Mega didn't train us that way. She said, but when I threw open the door, he's staggering, coming around my car. She said, then I hear two more shots. She said, I slammed that door and I run back in. I was so scared, I thought they were still shooting at us. But the second and third shot she heard came from the man next door, Mr. Wells. His kids were in bed, and at that time, he had a 12-year-old daughter named Paulette. And Paulette said, the first window, that was our bedroom, she said, and I had a top bunk. We had bunk beds. She said, I saw Mr. Evers when he drove up. He got out of his car, and he went to his trunk and came up out of there with an armful of white stuff that I learned later was T-shirts. She said, then I heard this loud shot. She said, Mr. Evers was falling and struggling and hanging on to the poles and the cars. She said, I was so scared. I was just jumping up and down in my bed screaming. And my daddy ran in there, looked out the window, saw Mr. Evers, got his pistol and walked out on his porch and fired two shots in the air. Those were the other shots Mrs. Evers heard. Mr. Wells said, I wasn't aiming at anybody. He said, I was just hoping to run whoever it was away. He said, I didn't see anybody. I only saw Mega. Another man named Mr. Quinn lived all the way across that street over there on into another little area. And he said, when I heard the shots, I just started running into the neighborhood. He said, but when I made it this far, I saw Mr. Wells under the carport struggling with Maga. He said, I stopped and I helped bring him in. He said, we brought him in here and placed him right here on the floor. Mrs. Evers said, we waited on an ambulance that never came for Maga. Some said one was called, some said one was not called. She said, but no ambulance ever came for him. Mr. Wells then, she said, after a little bit, said to her, Merle, give me a mattress. And he took a mattress off of Rena's bed, which was the first room, and put Mega on that mattress and put him in Mr. Wells' station wagon. And Mrs. Evers said, Mr. Wells said to her, I'm going to the closest hospital and the best. He considered it the best because at that time it was basically all white. The basement was reserved for emergency colors. But once you stabilize them or whatever happened, you had to ship them on out. Mr. Wells said, when we made it to that hospital, he said, two people came out and looked in the station wagon and saw Mega and began apologizing. You brought him to the wrong place. This is not a colored <coughs> hospital. If we treat him, we can lose our license, Jim Crow law. We don't have any blood for transfusion. Again, Jim Crow law, you didn't mix white and colored blood. 
No colors on staff except one nurse, Mrs. Emma Matthews. And Mrs. Matthews is 95 years old now, still living on State Street. He said, but after a little bit, a white man stepped up and said, if they let you bring him in, I'll work on him. And after some more talk, they, meaning the people in the hospital, got Mega and took him in. Mega's doctor made it there, A.B. Britton, been dead now about two years, a little better. Dr. Britton said, I went there just in case they had said there is no doctor. He said, but at that time, I knew I didn't have permission to work there either. He said, I'm a colored man. He said, but I could admit my patients. He said, but once they entered the door, I had nothing else to do with them. He said, but they didn't know who Mega was until I made it there. They didn't tell him who he was, possibly on purpose. But Mr. Uh, Dr. Britton said, when I made it there, he said, I asked them, do you know who this is? And they said, no. And I said, this is Mega Evers. He said, and one of the doctors said, oh my God, we got Mega Evers in here. But Dr. Britton said, they really tried. They really tried to save Mega. So we asked him, do you think they would have made it had, he would have made it had they worked on him as soon as he got there? He said, I doubt it. He said, that's, that's why we all were so amazed to had access to Mega, that he was alert. He said, Mega was talking making good sense at first. He said he began to lose it after about 15 minutes. But Dr. Britton wouldn't allow us to say Mega died. He said he lived 45 minutes after getting there. And we know that he didn't make it because Dr. Britton said half of Mega's chest was missing. But the bullet caught him in his back on his right shoulder, went through the last pane of the window. As you go through this area, you will see photographs from that night. Through the wall, that's the bullet hole in the wall. On into the kitchen, exiting over. We have a toaster there. She had a toaster oven. Hitting her refrigerator dead center because she got it across the back door. Ricocheted from there over to the countertop. Underneath the radio over there, you'll see a little nick in the wall where it hit. Came back down, resting underneath this big watermelon she has on, on the countertop. This is where it wound up. Mrs. Evers always said, that bullet split my melon and went on over into the sink. Well, Mr. Fred Sanders, who's an amazing man to talk to, who was the policeman. All policemen were white at that time. Mr. Fred Sanders was the lead policeman who really, they saw the case right here in Mississippi. Uh, he told me, he came a couple of years ago and spent half a day with me. But he said that we saw the case right here. He said, but... They didn't want Mississippi to get the credit for it. He said, J. Edgar Hoover was, the, you know what he was. He was a real guy. But anyway, he said, my superior got a call from Robert Kennedy, who was attorney general at that time, saying, turn your information over to J. Edgar Hoover. And Mr. Sanders said, I want you to know. Had we waited on J. Edgar Hoover to solve the crime, it never would have gotten served. Uh -oh. He said, but never would have gotten up. Uh, saved. He said, but we saw the problem right here. We saw the murder. Then he began to talk about that night. He said, I told you whites lived on that end. He said, four white kids came to me running when I made it into the community. He said, when we got the call and came into the community, he said, the people were in here, both black and white. He said, I don't know where they came from. He said, but they were here. He said, but Mrs. Evers was under the carport with friends. She wouldn't let us in at first. She was screaming, where were you when we needed you? You all helped cause my husband's death. And she was saying that because the police had, Maggie had been beaten up by police twice, but they would be trailing him, but some would say it was for his own good. But he said she wouldn't let us in. He said, but those four, he, he said, was four white kids came to me running, two girls and two boys. He said, one of the boys ran up to me and said, sir, whoever did it was over in these bushes because we were walking our girlfriend's home and the bullet went right by my ear. Oh. Mr. Sanders said, I told them, go home and tell your parents and meet me back here first thing tomorrow morning. He said, because at that time, he said, you know, all we had was a pistol, a flashlight, and a blackjack. Mm -hmm. He said, those kids came back. He said, and one of the boys who kept over here, sir, walking with me. He said, we walk a little piece. He said, the grass was all, there was a spot where the grass was all matted down. He said, a lot of cigarette butts candy and gum wrappers. He said, and I said, this is where the person was lying in wait. He said, the kid is still saying, over here, sir. He said, we go a little further. He said, there's a small tree and one of the limbs had the bark knocked off. He said, I surmise this is where the person placed his gun. He said, the kid is still saying, over here, sir, over here. He said, we walk a little further. 
the kid began screaming, here's a gun, sir, here's a gun. He oh said, it was resting God. right up in the honeysuckle wow. vine. He said, that's where we got it from. He said, but when Mrs. Evers finally let us in, he said, I followed the path of the bullet and I came looking for it. He said, I saw the hole in the wall, I saw the refrigerator dinner. He said, but I didn't see a bullet. He said, but on that counter, she had this huge watermelon. He said, and it was just dripping. He said, I touched the melon and the bullet slid right on over to the sink. He said, that's where we got it from, out of the sink. Then he talked about, they cleaned the melon up and as you go through, you're gonna see photographs from that night where, they, um, where the melon was and all of that. But anyway, he talked about all of the time they put in behind Beckwith, we know that it took them 31 years to find Beckwith guilty. And when they found him guilty, it was not necessarily a murder in Mega, but he robbed Mega Ellis of his civil rights. Sentenced Beckwith to life in prison, he spent a lot of time right downtown in the city jail. Mrs. Mary Ann Ballas, the white girl, well, she's not a girl anymore, <laughs> young lady who wrote the book, that that movie was based on, her book was titled The Murder of Mega Evers, The Trial of Byron D. Beckwith and the Haunting of the New South. She said, this is where I interviewed Mr. Beckwith, even all of this time later. Mr. Beckwith doors were not locked. People visited him, brought him whatever they wanted, except they couldn't bring a gun in. Eventually, someone rumored that they saw him walking outside, which I doubt, but then they sent him to Rankin County Penal Farm, a little penal farm not to about 30 miles from here placed Mr. Beckwith on the 24-hour suicidal watch. A lot of his people, a lot of the people had been here who was responsible for him. He wouldn't eat any dark foods. He said, bring him a Coke, dark drink. You hear him screaming outside the facility that they were trying to kill him. Eventually, Beckwith died, and he died in the same hospital Mega died in, <laughs> just bigger and better, the University Medical Center now. Buried, he's buried up in in the uh, mountains up in Tennessee, because that's where he had fled after mm -hmm. that second trial. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Evers had, they, she and Maga had three kids. She was pregnant with the fourth, lost that one because mm -hmm. of all of the trauma. Mm -hmm. She wanted to get out of here. She was angry and she was afraid. And she said, I had some friends in California. So they kept encouraging me to come there. Took about a year to sell out stuff and raise monies to get out of here. And then the National NAACP stepped in and helped her reload to Cal relocate to California, Claremont. That's where she still is. So we said those friends must have been white. She's still the only black in the neighborhood. Uh, her kids, the oldest, Daryl. Daryl didn't talk for a long time after he saw his dad in the driveway. Mrs. Ever said after we got to California, this white coach got him and began working with the sports and brought him back. But Daryl changed, became very quiet and he did have a family. He died, the died in 2001. Mm. Mrs. Evans said he had colon cancer. We found out it was too late. Rena, the daughter who was eight, Rena's back here in Jackson. Mm. She and her mom founded the Mega Murder Evers Institute. They deal with young people, especially young boys, uh, trying to turn their lives around, that kind of thing. But Rena runs, they got three different chapters. Rena runs the one that is, is in Mississippi, so she lives here most of the time. The baby boy, James Van Dyke, he is still in California, he and his family. Mrs. Evers, still in California. She comes here, uh, quite used to come quite often, and she, since the Civil Rights Museum has opened, she's been here twice, I think, to Jackson twice. I know she, she opened the museum, she did the opening speech, if you will. The first room was the daughter's room, the second room was the Evers room, and the third room was the boys' room, where you see the mattresses are actually on the floor with the boys' room, but they all were on the floor. In the, uh, we call it the vision room, a lot of writing and photographs and that kind of stuff, and you are allowed to take uh, pictures, because I know if Park Service takes it over, they don't let you take pictures. House this small, they might not even let you enter. Uh, they will do small places, they usually do a walk around and open up the windows and let you look in. But anyway, if you have questions, I'll try to answer them for you, or you can ask later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is the furniture in the house authentic, or? Is it in Like, what? is it authentic? Was it actually the uh, first? No. She okay. sold most of her, she sold quite a bit of her furniture. <coughs> we know who she sold some of it to. Okay. Um, 
But when, when Castle Rock did the house, we didn't know at that point because they probably would have bought it back from them. But this was placed in here by Castle Rock. But this is basically, when you walk through and look at other photographs, this is what her house kind of looked right. like that. Um, Thank at you. that time. Excuse me. Yeah. What um, uh, book or where could I get the information basically that you were sharing with us? Where could we find that? Oh, it's so many books. I used to have a listing of books. Let okay. me see. Uh, you can, uh, The Ghost of Mississippi by uh, Mary Ann Ballas. Well, it's really, the book is called The Murder Maybe It Was the Trial of Byron D. LeBeck Within the Haunting of the New South, but it's, I think it's, it is The Ghost of Mississippi. You go online, there's a lot of them. There's a, one by a young man that just did it about four years ago, just simply titled Mega Evans. And his name is Williams. Uh, what's his first name? Robert uh, God Walker. Mm -hmm. I think of it in a minute. But his last name is William. But then I'm gonna do another listing. I've run out of it. And they're, they're about ten or fifteen books. Okay. Yeah. But in a lot of the stuff, as I say, you you pull it up. It's out there. And they will give you the names of books and stuff. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Joan Trump Powell Mulholland, her son, uh, Loki, did a book on her, and I think it's called A Simple Woman Named Joan Trump Powell Mulholland. She was the first white to get a degree, supposedly. First white to get a degree from uh, Tougaloo College. From what college? Tougaloo. You never heard, heard of Tougaloo College? What is it called? T O U G A L O O, meaning. Um, oh God. <laughs> we got stuck in game, huh? I do. I do. Tugaloo College. We don't have a picture of Tugaloo on here, but this is this is just a little something we put together. I had to make copies because I'm waiting on my other brochure. But Tugaloo is a. Um, it's a historically black college. You have heard of uh, um, what's the college in, in Washington D.C. that Howard. that Howard University, yes. sister college. Okay. Um, this University. This yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you got about you had about five hundred. You have about probably about a hundred and something now. Oh, uh, but two at, when when slavery ended, what was that? About three hundred years ago. <laughs> When slavery ended, this white thing called American um, Association, um, it was like a, a ministers, a lot of ministers, a lot of people got together. The American Association got together and they founded about 450 institutions for what they called the training of Negroes. Some were to train teachers, some were to train doctors, uh, some were simply to teach people how to farm, some were spoke in essence. They was they were open to civilize us. Mm. Okay? And so Tugaloo is one of those. Tugaloo is known for turning out lawyers and doctors. We have a program, uh, we have that connection in an exchange program with Howard University Howard University and soon but not necessarily not only Howard, but a Brown University and soon with Harvard. We already have kind of an exchange program with Harvard, but it's, it's picking up more now. And so we about a, we sit on about 450 acres of our campus. A little wooded campus up here. But anyway, so at the turn of the century, when all of these places were founded, as I said, it was they were founded by whites. Okay. And for different purposes. Mm -hmm. And so because they were private, the majority of them were private. Tougaloo was private. And as I said, we are gated campus. Mm -hmm. And during the terrible years, people would come to Tougaloo and perform and raise monies for the movement and that kind of thing. And they wouldn't perform out in the city. When Robert Kennedy came to Mississippi, he wouldn't perform, he wouldn't speak out in the city. He would rap bunch, all of these mm -hmm. people. Uh, and so because Tougaloo is a huge campus, they, um, helicopters would land on Tougaloo's campus with movie stars and all of this. Do you ever watch um, 60 Minutes? Yes. Was it, uh, last Sunday, um, what's her name? Oh, God, the white girl. Uh, mm, that was a, a new, uh, country singer like. She she performed it too, and would come in and they raised money for the civil rights movement. Uh, and so 
that's kind of like, you know, that was, that's Tougaloo's history. Yeah. Okay. So do you work at Tougaloo? I, I do. I do. The Tougaloo owns the house right now. Oh, and uh, okay. I just, I do the house basically. But I used to do the archives. I went to Tougaloo doing something else. But because of uh, my interest in civil rights and because I met Meg Evans in college and that kind of stuff, so I started doing it. They asked me to do the tours and I've been doing them ever since. Mm -hmm. But um, I was trying to think of the young, the right girl. Yes. Who, uh, Who graduated? Was the first to graduate? Oh, but what? Joan Tom Powell. Yeah, I know her, Joan. But, you know, when the civil rights workers yeah. came into Mississippi, they call them, you know, uh, they called them civil rights workers. But when the freedom riders came in, yeah. Joan Trump Powell, Mulholland, and several of her classmates yeah. had applied to, after they, you know, made the ruling that, uh, the schools were to be integrated. Yes. Mm -hmm. She and her couple of her classmates had applied to schools in Mississippi and other, well, basically black colleges in the South. Mm -hmm. These are white girls, moments. But before she was to come in in the, oh, she was to come in in the fall mm -hmm. and enroll. But then that this this thing broke loose, the demonstrations and all of this. So she she came in early as a freedom rider. But she did enroll in Tougaloo and get her degree from there. She's the only white Delta that they know. They let her. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but she came in and got involved. And then this is when all these freedom riders came in here. You know, I, I mentioned earlier there were two young, two white boys that were murdered up in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you read about them. And Schwanner. Schwanner. And Goodman. Mm -hmm. yeah. Goodman. Cheney was the black boy. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so they, all of these white kids came in here and went up in the Delta and just saw how things were. And they put the word out. And they started soliciting clothing and all of that for people up there because that's they were in dire conditions. And so Megan was like the leader. He became, he was the first field secretary for the NAACP. But he would go, they would allow him to come to Tougaloo because Tougaloo was private. He couldn't speak anywhere else at these state places, state, you know, all yes. by the state, these schools. But he could come there and speak. And Tougaloo is gated. You got to come through a gate to get into uh -huh. onto that campus. And so he became the advisor to those student, students. And then when you were out there demonstrating and that kind of thing, and the police got in behind you, if you know, they used to have that thing, if I can just make it through the gates, to lose, they weren't gonna find you in those woods. It's 500 and some acres of it. And so that then to lose faculty and staff was involved got involved because the majority of Tulu's faculty were either Indians, white, you had some blacks, but they came out of this out of these different areas, places. And, and then you had you know, Germans, you know, fled Germany after when the Holocaust came yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. These people suddenly historically black colleges. So we had Berensky up there, uh, Ron Chanel, who was art, who fled and came, they settled in black colleges and they settled in uh, black neighborhoods. Whites wouldn't accept them. So you know, so they were they became advisors to the students as well. And so that's why I took them and, and didn't just a few years ago began to um, being supported, not supported, but getting aid or help from white businesses. They didn't support Tougaloo the College. These are militants, so to speak. But um, I'm trying to think of his name, who was uh, all the Tougaloo's presidents were white, except about 40 years ago. And then you had your first black president, who was also a graduate of Tougaloo College. But so that's why these schools, your know, historically black schools that were run mostly by whites and that kind of stuff was not really accepted. Yeah, but uh, as I said, we, we talked about just how they got involved because of, Berinsky was a, had been a judge, with well, a lawyer first, then a judge in Germany, then he came to 
to the United States and got a got a second degree as a judge. I mean, it became a judge and then a lawyer. You know. And he was like an advisor to those kids. Like, you within your rights if you do this, this, and this. So you have uh, you had a lot of, as I said, two of them never sit well yes. in the mouths of uh, the taste of the whites because of what they were doing. You had whites involved, but a lot of them was involved undercover. Yeah. Yes. Wow. So that's how uh, yes. I got involved in that. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, yes. thank you so much. Yeah, and thank you a lot for the details about how Megger set up his house. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a veteran as well, so I just see a lot of, of the sense and the reasonableness of him doing that and, and understanding he is a very defensive minded kind of security because of his veteran, his veteran you know, service. So I appreciate the details about that. It was very interesting. Just the double consciousness right. that blacks have to, to, have live. to live with. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. It's also like, you know, his training in the, in the military thought this is the best way to do this. Yeah, I, and I, I've had so many people to talk about the, uh, the type of the gut rifle and all that. Had a young man here, he ain't so young anymore. <laughs> but it was yesterday, he, yesterday he was talking about the gun and all that. And they got the gun uh, down there. Now, uh, they when they did a, uh, an exhibit, I got a trip around the house really quick. That's why they're not in the This is Mary Everson? No, she said this is the daughter's room. The daughter's room? Yeah, and the other one is. The two okay. sons? No, this is the daughter's room. The other one is the Everson, and then the sons are. Uh, no, the sons are the other room. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah